I am very excited to welcome back Trader Ferg. Very early to the uranium trade, very early to the coal trade, and the massive boost that came from Russia invading Ukraine. You've just been just absolutely crushing it in obscure trades, and so just super excited to hear about what you think is deep value right now. Thanks for having me back on, and I'd quickly point out that that was just absolute luck with Russia. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't see any of that. I didn't see any of that coming. So I yeah, I know. But, but any, any any credit for that? Yeah, and and uranium to extent. I didn't see the financial institutions get involved, which was the initial up leg on that. So yeah, I don't really deserve credit for that either. <laughs> I just yeah. saw the the imbalance. Yeah. So it always seems like luck, but like when you buy stuff like just in deep value territory, for some reason, markets always just love to just make that stuff pump. I don't know. Yep. It, yeah, it finds it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's Brad, like as he likes to say, position to get lucky. Yeah. Yes. Like, well, yeah. If you've got the setup then and the upside's greater than the downside, then whatever upside appears, then yeah, that, that's great. I'll take it. And I just keep concentrating on the downside. Which is um, yeah, how you how you survive these markets. So yeah, uh, yeah, no, it's worked out well. No, it has. And like, whereas if you buy stuff that's pumping for some reason, that's positioning not to get lucky. I don't know. It always works exactly. out that way. <laughs> so so yeah, I'm trying to build my own, re-engineer my energy portfolio. Lots happen. So just with just can't wait to just pick your brain on this stuff. So if we start with uranium, which obviously you were in extremely early, it's pumped like crazy, and so. The big question is, are we positioning ourselves to get lucky with prices this high? What is your what is your kind of outlook for uranium in the future? I'm just sitting tight. Yeah, I don't sort of really think that. I um, haven't seen any of the signals that I'd need to start trimming. Um, I think everyone gets too worked up about it at the moment. Like the Even the recent pullback, um, I was just watching um, Brandon Monroe and he was showing that of the spot market, I believe, I believe he stated like 87% um, of those, the trades recently were just wash trades, just back and forth between traders. Only um, the remainder was actually to a, a, a end buyer. And so that kind of tells you how much people are just overthinking the price. <laughs> yeah, you really yeah. you really have to be focused on term like spot. Spot's the only indicator we've got to work with and but yeah, really term terms what's going to really move this market in terms so um, opaque and yeah, it's all obvious after the point. Lots of sort of utilities don't even um, openly state it, but they um, keep it keep it close to their chest. So yeah, the the trick with uranium is um, is just being patient, sitting back and having having the signals to um, start trimming like I do. Like I've got a whole whole list each each of them will be just a, a gradual scaling out sort of five percent slices and most of them sort of are based around either seen seen signs that the supply gap can start closing um, and also seen some sort of behavioral signals as well and what I'm really spending all my time now is working out where that money's going to go I'm kind of putting a whole lot of different ideas on the shelf and sort of deciding which which is the juiciest and which will get the most sort of capital out of that trade and, and trying to yeah, create some cash later. Obviously add to them now when I when I can, if they if I think they're um the setup's good enough. Part of your signal for when to get out of uranium is when the supply cap gap starts to fill, but what about that chart that all the experts put together, which is like, this is supply, this is demand, and there's just so much air for years. Like, do you believe that to be true? That that's how it's going to be for years? Yeah, well, it's, it's one of the more interesting, like I've, I've talked about demand a lot because like supply gets all the focus with commodities and it's, it is what you should always focus on because demand can always be so... Um, so like hard to judge. Like I've I've like written a post a while back on my Substack saying the sort of difference between like fantasy demand and real demand. And what I was talking about there with fantasy demand, I think it was probably a bit harsh. I should have said, said called it inflated demand. But what I was talking about there was all the demand for EVs. Like I I don't see the EV adoption getting anywhere near what the projections are. And if anything, I I think a lot of people have tied the boat to the wrong sort of battery technology as well. 
So not only was the EV market already quite saturated, I don't think the sort of the lithium ion battery is going to win out ultimately to be like we're seeing with BYD, which has got most cost competitive cars. They're really focusing in on the sodium ion. So you, you just got to be super careful with those sort of demand charts there. And same goes for renewable renewables. I um I, I don't believe those sort of projections of 50 um, 50 percent of renewables by 2050. I reckon that'll that'll way undershoot. And so all the demand assumptions that go with it, I yeah, I don't want to be anywhere near, near those in my portfolio. Whereas on the other side of that, coming back to uranium, the uranium demand's kind of interesting and it's you don't have to it's kind of knowable demand. Like you, you have operating reactors, which are multi, multi-billion dollar um, operations that um, lots gone into it. And uranium, um, uranium doesn't make up a very large amount of like the overall um, operating cost. And so, yeah, it's a, uh, and then you can just look at reactors under construction because they do take a while. And so you can come up with quite a conservative um, demand estimate. And then, yeah, I always said be careful of like as people get more bullish on uranium, the demand will start climbing. So I'm just keeping super conservative with just operating reactors and those under under construction. Um, yeah, kind of like cancel everything else out, like the SMR demand and um yeah, other potential or oh, restarts. Restarts quite interesting because that is when you restart a reactor, you mm-hmm. um not only is it obviously a lot of these were supposed to be taken offline, but when you restart, you actually need a far higher, um, uh, what was it, this core, core load, or yeah, to, to restart a reactor anyway, it's about three times um, what it runs at in maintenance. And so it's actually quite significant when you see some of these policy reversals um, of countries saying they'll shut down the nuclear fleets and then reversing course. And so, yeah, all this is just a big roundabout way of saying the demand picture in uranium is quite noble. And so that supply demand gap is, yeah, there's no, there's so, no sort of, um, there's no real question over that in my mind. I just want to kind of work out where that demand, uh, the supply is going to come from. And if anything, there, um, there's more and more hits to the supply side that I see. It's, um, yeah, like, whether it's um, Kazataprom, just um, been nowhere near their substore agreements. That was always kind of my working thesis for a number of years is like they're um, going to miss and keep missing. And so there's a lot of players that were just um, assuming those pounds were, were given. There's just the sheer difficulty of bringing uranium projects on. Like it's, um, if, if you look back to the last uranium cycle of everyone that made grand promises Paladin was the only one that actually went from um, sort of early stage right through to production without the help of like a, a major or a JV. And so pays to remember that when getting all these grand promises from all these um, these uranium developers all over the place. So yeah, it's um, it's a sector I love. It's obviously my my heaviest weighting by a mile. And, <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing... I'm not seeing any any reason to start scaling out just yet. Um, I think wow. yeah, there'll be another big up leg um, to start incentivizing the supply side more. Yeah, see, that's unreal because you're up 10 to 20x in a lot of your positions. I mean, everyone could tell that just based on when you got into them publicly. And so you still think, even though the charts are like this, you think they'll just do something like that. That's that's Otherwise, you'd be selling. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, so, so yeah, just doing the math, even if you take out the promised demand with the SMRs and all the future promises, you still, it's like, why would you ever get out? Because the supply gap doesn't seem to be filled anytime soon. I mean, even if uranium went to $200 per pound, like it still has to go higher, right? It seems because there's just nowhere to get that uranium or is there a way to get it? Well, there'll be a point at which I just decide to pull the pin because the the valuation gap gets too large between these other um, things I got my eye on. Like there will yeah. be, there'll be a point at which you sh- it's it's always a question when you decide to sell something that it's like, where's the money going to go? And if 
if there's a point at which um, I'm just feeling we get into like speculation territory, like stuff's just getting crazy. And I think that will come with the sort of financial vehicles piling on at some point. Um, I don't want to be part of that. Like that's, that becomes more of a guessing game and it'll just be easy to roll it into some of my other, to just, just hard assets that's really knowable. I'm really comfortable with the thesis. I've done a lot of work on it. And yeah, I'll obviously have enough of a sort of capital base to um, sort of roll it over and be quite happy. I'll probably keep some on the table. Like I've always said that um, it was like one of the first blogs I wrote was the monkey trap on um, on my, uh, my old blog. And it was just the idea that like, you have to be prepared to um, to exit early, and it, at the same time, it's almost helpful for your psychology to leave a little bit on uh, to leave a little bit in the account. So I'll probably try and try and time the top of like the last five ten percent of the account um, that my uranium position, just to uh, make myself feel good, good about it. But probably probably write it over the top and stuff it up. But the most important thing is that I've slowly scaled out um, before it's got really silly, and and really rebalanced into positions that I think have a nice long runway, have um, a solid moat around them and will do really well in where I see the world going in the next sort of three to five years, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So you're looking at just extreme, like extreme froth, like from the mainstream, the big financial firms just, and then you'll, then maybe you'll see just obscene valuations in these assets. I think Cameco was pretty richly valued at some point. Maybe some of the, I mean, some of these mines do seem like, I guess maybe you can do a projection, like, okay, they're going to have to produce way more uranium than they have in the ground to meet. Mm. And then it's like crazy. Then their valuations get crazy and you're like, okay, maybe I'll, I'll sell or something. Yeah. Well, the, the thing with valuations as well is like, it's like, as opposed to like what, like it's, there's no substitute with uranium for these, um, for a reactor. Like it's not like it can get substituted out or, I always think that's kind of like a flaw in a lot of people that um, yeah, are comparing it to something else. I'm like, oh, it's, it's, it's okay to yeah, jump across from uranium to copper or something, but it's not it's not apples for apples and it's not, you don't have some price and sense of buyers like you do with uranium. So yeah, I, yeah that, that's why I'm, I'm kind of, that's why I did this whole exit plan and plan to kind of stick to it quite religiously because I, I, trades like this don't come around very often. Either way, if someone's getting in now, they're still just based on supply demand fundamentals, massive upside, it seems. Yeah, yeah, but I, I don't recommend getting in now. <laughs> oh. Because I think the the sort of the risk reward is, is, is probably better. Like I, I've always got this kind of idea that um, make the majority of the money sort of three, four years down the road. And so the risk reward is better um, in some other sectors now um that i'm sort of seeing set up and so really putting a lot of time into sort of developing conviction in them and that's yeah where i've been looking to sort of roll the profits and like why you ask not sort of roll earlier like there's a lot of factors like um obviously taxes play play a decent role there's yeah trying to time time a good exit if you've got like spend a lot of time on uranium so have a good idea when uh, as I keep coming back to the exit plan, I want to see that through. And then that that will help um, for a lot of capital across and, and seem sort of a longer, I see uranium, could be very wrong, but I, I see uranium having a far tighter setup at the moment than some of the places I'm looking to allocate capital. Classic example that I've talked about multiple times is um, sort of the idea of rolling uranium into coal. I see coal being not nearly as sort of boom bust having a far longer runway and so um i don't sort of i see the price is still being there to sort of rebalance over the next few years um and still be really attractive I don't see sort of coal doing a sort of a uranium as well yeah that's the tricky part of being a value investor because like i'm uncomfortable owning stuff that's just like pumping and everyone's getting excited about whereas you see like the deep value plays in coal and, and you want to buy them but then you see like the really good assets just keep going up and like these uranium mines haven't hit their all-time highs at all right do you think that's possible that some of these could yeah yeah definitely 
That's yeah. also remembering that like we're looking at nominal dollars as well. Like everything's getting inflated. I, yeah. A lot of people don't even realize, like I think I haven't even run it lately. Last time I ran it, like a, what a $20, $20 worth today. It's like dollar, um, it's been like 25% inflation over those three years. Yeah. So right. it's just, yeah, you just, yeah, you got to, yeah. And that, and that, that's the same amount that was over the last like 10 years or even longer. And so, yeah, you've got to remember, yeah, a lot of the charts we're looking at are nominal. And so, yeah, we can heavily, um, a lot of things are getting sort of in, inflated. And so you've got to keep an eye on that as well. Absolutely. E either way, you're, you're, so you're bullish uranium, but you just find deeper value elsewhere. So this is where it gets really exciting because you're the best at finding this like deep, 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 deep value. It's, it's worked for you in the past. So now what, what do you see right now as being kind of like, I don't know if they're hand in hand, but the most hated asset and the deepest value asset, are they the same right now? There's not that much super hated stuff left, honestly. Like it's um, a lot of stuff left the station. Um, probably the last like super hated sector is still um, certain shipbuilders. That's the last ones that have yet to even show signs of life. So if you want to be super early, that's where like the big gains are, but you've got to have a, a really long time frame and you've got to be careful not to get diluted. But where my where I'm really focusing is I'm just trying to work out like if uh, it's what my mentor taught me is like, if you can just try and picture where the world will be in like five years and then, um, and then like think what, what will be, what will everyone be seen then and what will be in demand and the world I see will be higher, higher inflation, tighter money, um, scarcer energy. And so I think what everyone will be fighting over will be, tangible assets and the thing that will be most um, most sought after will be the things that have sort of the highest replacement cost of the tangible assets and so that's what I've been kind of scanning the market for is to think where can I get something for absolute cents on the dollar that in another five years we'll be working out how to try and um, replace these and not really having the ability to do so and so the cash flow these things will be able to throw off will be will be crazy and the way that I like to try and maximize as well was to try and bottom pick them by looking at the sectors that are high hyper cyclical and the, we're going through a bankruptcy cycle and the ones that i've the earliest ones that i was writing about back on my old blog as well and i keep beating the drum all this time was the sort of the offshore drillers those were those right. are the absolute ob obvious ones yeah like a a um a company that's yeah super cyclical over ordered bought a whole lot of um very expensive assets if you're talking drill ships talking <laughs> near near a billion now over a billion at sort of today's replacement um cost then went bankrupt and wrote all the money off that was used to acquire those so now you've got pretty heavy moat when you consider any competitors now I've got to not to come up with that and got to come up with that in a far tighter monetary regime like back then you finance them with sort of 10 percent money down a future competitors looking at sort of 40 percent positive down to finance them before you consider that they sent all the shipyards broke that were building them and so a lot of the statistics and stats on the amount of the reduction in shipyard capacity doesn't even take into account that like shipyards can be quite strategic assets for government. So a lot of them are quite subsidized by the government. They provide a lot of um, employment. Um, there's obviously defense implications. So a lot of them will never let sort of a shipyard go under. So a lot of the shipyards that went under were the more specialist, the smaller shipyards and everything that was offshore focused. So um, seen of the overall Shipyard industry got nearly cut in half, I think. Um, same as number of yards and um, capacities, um, not not far behind. But if you go to like the smaller shipyards, it was it was almost um, two thirds reduction. And so those are the ones that were specialised in a lot of this offshore equipment. And so what I'm trying to work out in my head is like, what what is what does the queue look like? Like if I was to jump forward in time and land in like um, 
five years from now, what would the queue look like and who's at the back of the queue? And I want to own as much as possible of who's at the back of the queue because whoever's at the back of the queue is going to have the longest um, run of sort of being able to generate cash flow without having any additional competition come in, have additional um, sort of a big glut of um, new builds move through the order book because that's what these guys are ultimately all hypercyclical. They're all, they're all shitty businesses because they, as soon as they make money, they over order. This, this whole thing is like, it's um, kind of interesting because it's like using a lot of like almost like Buffett language because Buffett is the one like obviously that's using his moats idea and he's using it for like sort of hold forever businesses. <laughs> yeah. Using it for like <laughs> shitty drill ships that have all gone bankrupt and um, yeah. will ultimately overbuild on a long enough time frame. But it's just knowing that there will be this window that they'll be able to just print cash. And what's also interesting is there's um, yeah, some of them sort of going after their own share count, which is something I'm taking, paying a lot more attention to as well. Like um, starting to try, trying to understand that. And that can create pretty outstanding performance if um, just with share buybacks. Yeah. So just starting from the beginning of that one. So the narrative right now with regards to oil and I guess coal and, and fossil fuels is technology is getting better and better. We're able to get more and more out of what we have as they transition away. The demand is going to slowly diminish that from this stuff. And so because we have technology boosting supply, we have demand slowly falling the world's moving away from this stuff. And so you're trying to talk, you're talking about offshore, like the stuff so capital intensive, which is going to be like probably the last place anyone would want to put money. Right. Yeah. Because so, so like the supply demand fundamentals from what everyone is looking at just are, are terrible for oil. And so why do you disagree with that? Just to start. So, so for oil, like, yeah, because there's two separate, like you can talk to the actual utilization for offshore and the, the break-evens, but just, just for oil, it, it really is like a Permian story at the moment. So the, um, it's why I've been, been pretty damn wrong on oil um, lately is the fact that I just didn't see, didn't see the Permian, uh, the US keep on chugging yeah. out like it has, like it's, um, can't really deny it. They, they just keep, um, keep pumping and um, I, I question how much it was a sort of productivity gain uh, uh, gain I've talked to um, a few people I really respect I've even had a few on my show and they're saying that it's probably like a somewhere around a third of it was um, was producers really like um, bleeding the assets for m a like trying to trying to juice returns to um, make themselves look good for possible m a but yeah there's two 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 thirds left was productivity gains which is which is pretty damn impressive so a lot of this hinges on being right with um the permian if I'm wrong for the permian and um and the oil just keeps keeps climbing then yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be a hard hard trade as in this in this world where we think we'll be off um we won't need fossil fuels and yeah, we demand's gonna keep dropping off. No, no one no one is as comfortable throwing money at sort of long cycle assets. Even even when you look at the break evens, the um offshore's got some of the lowest break in the evens, it's below shale now. And so we'll keep attracting money in that way, but it's gonna get a lot more money thrown at it if shale really starts to roll over. And that's kind of my inherent bet with a lot of this is I think shale is gonna roll over. Um, a lot quicker than everyone is um, anticipating. Granted, kind of it's taking a lot longer than I thought to roll over. <laughs> yeah. And so that's that's quite important. And then the other fact is there's an awful lot of low break, break even oil out there that's um, with offshore. That's just no one's no one's wanted to front up with the um, with the capex because. When you think you're going to wean yourself off oil, you don't you don't want to throw um, like multi billion capex for a um, for a, a big offshore um, project, 
And so that that's that's played a factor as well. But I think I think we're gonna see that um that reverse and I think that'll reverse at the same time where we're seeing a lot of the the drillers start to really um hit the wall with utilization as a lot of these have had sort of the cold stack fleet that's slowly getting worked through. And once that um the last of the cold stacks come out, then um, day rates the, the drillers can start naming their day rate and that's when that's when things will get interesting but i think that's probably probably still a year yeah so that makes total sense and so but like i've been watching exxon mobile they have they have like a secret sauce with their technology and they just keep buying up like the big fields and they have really good production. So I think these like big guys figured out how to get, how to increase their utilization. So I guess my question is like, like what, what, what are you seeing at, over there in shale that maybe points to the fact that it'll be less and less productive. So we'll have to be moving towards offshore. So it's pretty much looking at everything bar the Permian's rolling over. And so there's this fact once you get over, uh, once you produce 50% of the field, the drop-off can be quite um, quite substantial. Like shales, shales not sort of 10% decline that um, all the sort of long cycle stuff is. This can be um, yeah, like really roll over, like sort of 60, 70 percent. And so there's a big inherent assumption that it can keep growing. You've also got like has has it been high graded? Um, like a lot of this is like how much is actually productivity gains and how much is just using up all the tier one acreage. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, it's a bit that I think it will eventually go the way of um, all the other, the other shale fields that we're seeing uh, roll over. It's, um, and yes, the Permian is, yeah, is the big question. It's like, how, how long can it hold up? And ultimately, like it, I just don't think it can even grow to the, the projections. Like even if it holds up for a bit longer, I, yeah, I don't see it. I don't see it being because when you look at where all of sort of the additional um, oil capacities come from over the last decade, it's pretty much all been um, all been shale. And so it really is the big question of um, it's not going to be where the growth will come from moving forward. And it it can't just kind of like stop and plateau either. Like it's yeah, it's pretty it's pretty binary. Once yeah. it once it rolls over, if it really rolls over. Okay, so it's kind of like a matter of time. You're saying like whether it's two years, three years, it's going to run out essentially. Like like that's like all field yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah that's my take yeah okay and so in the meantime, you're just going to be stacking like the next big oil producers, which is, which is you're saying is going to move offshore. Yeah. yeah, And I think to a certain extent, a lot of the stuff works at this, um, at this break even because there's the other side of it that we're constantly underestimating um, oil demand growth. Like we um, got one, one chart that I love showing that's the IEA sort of every year underestimating developing markets um, oil demand and every year they they underestimate it by about a million barrels per day. And then the end of the year, they have to revise it. And they've done this for like years. <laughs> they just made the same mistake <laughs> year after year after year. And so there's uh, the fact that we've got to keep up with that demand growth. That demand growth is coming from a developing, developing world. It is um, just based on population growth alone. Need to add another sort of 50% over the next sort of 20, 20 30 years. Um, and that's before you even consider like a lot of these are um, climbing the S curve. So that if you sort of have pretty, I think it's fairly conservative over. So by 2050, see the energy system more or less needing to double. Um, and so when when you work with those numbers, it's um, pretty clear that there needs to be a lot of growth and a lot of a lot of what we're telling ourselves with uh, like EV adoption rate. It's essentially taking the other side. A lot of what I do is take the other side of the EV adoption rates and the renewables um, re renewable projections. I don't I don't see any of that being viable, and so I'm happy to keep um, keep hammering away with um, the other side of that. Would be it's renewables, it's coal, EVs, it's oil. Because also with the um, with oil, 
if you forget that like EVs are actually a tiny part of um, transport, passenger transport. It's not even a large percentage of oil demands. It's like 20, like quarter, 20, 25%, like half is um, not even transport based. It's chemicals. And there's, there's almost, yeah, there's seen very few um, substitutes for, for oil, for all the plastics, for all the um, chemicals that we need. And, um, yeah, you can't have electric airplanes, even even shipping, they're, um, they're struggling. And so it's, um, yeah, it's just, it's just a fantasy that we're going to get off it quickly. And so I'll just keep taking the other side of that. Yeah, there's so much to talk about, like just to unpack here. So one aspect is nuclear. So you don't think in like 15 years that nuclear could just eat away at this demand in terms of the nuclear growth? Or do you think that... It's it's just impossible that it would. Well, we can see it. I mean, the, we have, well, the good thing with nuclear is you can see. Yeah. <laughs> you can't you can't produce a you can't throw up a nuclear plant like you can to a turbine or a coal plant. You you see it. Um, you have to get approved. The quickest you can build one in China is probably five six years. Um, so yeah, it's 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 kind of like a the. Um, food movie for the snake you see it coming down the system it's not going to be a surprise and so that's always been my uh, i always love the sort of inherent hedge between coal and nuclear as well like coal's coal's what you play when you think energy policy is stupid and you know it'll be the break the glass option like i always said there's like there's kind of three layers like once you accept that wind and solar aren't like a sort of mass scale solution sure there's if you've got super cheap land and you're in the right spot, um, solar can provide value up to maybe maybe 15, 20% of the grid. But after that, it's worthless. When when makes sense at an even smaller scale. And so you've got hydro, but a lot, most of that's already been built out. So when, once you kind of do away with that idea, then you're left with um, either coal, gas, or uh or nuclear and coal's coal's like the easiest option you don't have to have any um expensive infrastructure you don't have to like have the obviously like lng's um all the liquefaction all the lng tankers there everything's super expensive so coal's the sort of the break the glass it's like what we saw with germany when things went wrong they went straight back to coal um and yeah that's going to be most of the developing world they're not it makes no sense for the majority of them to um, pursue renewables and a lot of them don't have access to gas and yeah, they will have the finance to build out nuclear. So that's why I kind of remain so bullish on coal. I just see, I see coal hefting to um, provide a lot of the power for the growth that they require. Yeah, you see it out of India. I always use India as a, like a, a leading indicator is the fact that their, their energy minister just came out and said like, when getting pushed on the emissions side of things, he's like, I will not, um, I will not sacrifice my growth for emissions. Like I, I don't care if I need to import more coal, completely expand the coal fleet. That's what we'll do. And I think most, um, developing countries will, will follow that model. None of them are nearly as, um, nearly as sort of ideologically driven as the West. <laughs> So, okay, so, okay, so nuclear is coming, but in the next decade, it's not going to be enough to offset fossil fuels and neither are the renewable projections. And so we have this, you know, next decade, essential huge demand for these assets, which is very exciting. And so then, then the other component is they are tied to kind of growth. And you're saying there's lots of growth in Asia and developing countries. And, you know, there's always a, the risk of a world recession, but that um, doesn't seem like we're doing recessions anymore, right? We're just printing money, debasing the currency because we can't afford a recession. What, what you're pointing to there is this is something I got quite wrong. And it's kind of quite, quite common is when you have a really Western centric view. And so we kind of view everything through what's going on in the West dictates the world. And like, it always, I always remember reading, you can get a hold of Putin's speech and he refers to like us as like, the golden billion i think that we can dictate everything the world does forgetting that there's what's world population eight eight billion and so 
I think I think the West now depend depends what you define as the West, like 1.6 billion. And the rest of the world is um they've all they want to increase their standard of living. They they a lot of them are, are growing just fine. Like I look at sort of a lot of the equal wake in indices of the likes of like um Brazil, Turkey, and they're they're doing just fine. They're keeping up with the US if you if you take out the sort of the, the mag seven outperformance and something that I've kind of wrapped my head around more recently, largely thanks to um, Louis Garv is the, the fact that they're actually getting access to commodities in their own currencies now. And so this is, this is like, this is huge when all we get fed in the West is how China's about to explode. And yeah. an extension of that is that that'll drag drag the rest of the developing market with uh, developing market with it mm -hmm. and it's just going to be it's just going to be a big mess and so you should kind of avoid it because even i just opened the bloomberg app, app before i jumped on and the first two stories were how evergrande's like had like a massive 80 billion fraud and it's about to take down the whole system and you can see why people are just like ah i don't i don't want to take the risk here yeah but what that's missing is so the more interesting stats is that last year 20 percent of all oil trade was in non-usd and so this is just developing countries now trading with each other and not needing us dollars this is countries going directly to russia and china and once that kicks off they can they no longer need to keep um the sort of us dollar is no longer sort of the bottleneck for them they can start um accessing all the commodities they need with their own currency or with um, friendly terms from the countries they're requesting them from. And that really fires up the growth engine. So it's it's fascinating how how much we get fed of the sort of the negative China story and how how bullish the sort of developing market setup is, um, in my view. That's what and I think Cole's a big story there. And so I think that's that's where a lot of people are going to get wrong footed is um thing that the safe space to be is like this kind of this tech AI EV green narrative. And I think I think that's um it's gonna to prove to all have been a massive dumpster fire for right. shareholders. Yeah, no, no, no. That's 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 a great way of putting it. And so just based on population growth alone, there's gonna be a huge bid, a huge bid for these fossil fuels. So coal. And offshore drilling essentially period yeah, we, you, you can it's kind of interesting when you just just run the numbers like i i have this debate occasionally with people that are quite malthusian and that they'll they'll question the population growth but if you if you run with demographics which are usually pretty accurate you've got um you've got like what 1.6 billion in developed countries we consume uh 13 barrels per person per year and the the rest, the um, so six point four billion, they they consume I think it's three barrels per person per year, and so on their population growth alone, they are set to add around two billion people by two thousand fifty, and so that adds fifty percent to the energy system, and if you assume, which is what's playing out now, that they climb the S curve and take that three barrels per person to four barrels per person, that adds another 50% to the energy system. So those two, so you, you can argue it, like if you want to get really Malthusian and say those two billion people, they all um, don't get born for whatever reason, you still got the, um, the current population trying to climb the energy curve. And so that's, I, I just see it as super bullish either way as, um, is we're trying to we're trying to pretend all that growth won't happen because there's another thing if you dig through a lot of the IEAs not only have you got the got the sort of crazy projections of renewables um, making up a large proportion of the energy system which makes no sense you've also got large efficiency gains which is always just stupidity because efficiency gains don't don't work the way they're showing that you, you don't have an efficiency gain and then reduce the overall demand with known as Jevron, Jevron's paradox is the more efficient, the more energy you use. And it's, um, 
that's the way it's always worked. And so that's, um, I just, I just see demand growth being super, um, energy demand being super robust moving forward. And um, I'll keep playing that trend. Yeah. So even with arguments against it, like a global recession or whatever, you, like the math is there, the growth is there, period. So there's going to be a big bid for for affordable energy. So this comes to the, mo the most exciting question to me, which is like, in your view, where is the most, or like a few sectors, what are the most asymmetric bets currently that if your thesis plays out, will just have the most potential massive upside? <laughs> yeah, so it's, the, the trickier thing with it is they, there, there's some really easy, um, easy ones to identify, but the, then it's like, what will, what will be unlisted by governments? And so like a classic, classic example is like the Queensland coal place. So it was, it was kind of easy to see them being able to spit out cash flow, but then the in came uh, the royalties and have that cash flow taken off you. You've seen similar similar events happen all around the world. You've seen like a sort of an eighty five percent profit tax in the UK. You've seen the likes of Indonesia just um, ban exports um, for a period to support the domestic market. You've seen I think it's the Chile that's talked about nationalising their um, some of their reserves. You, you've got um, you've got Colombia with sort of. Um, talking about sort of keeping in the ground for coal reserves. So you, it's, I think it's easy to spot some of the stuff, but it'll be harder to spot stuff that you can play for a long time without having government intervention, nationalisation. And I, I've ended up sort of viewing, like I talked about before, like trying to work out that queue. A, a lot of the queue is around um, the moment. I'm sort of still tossing up in my head whether it's, Drill ships, VLCCs, um, certain shipbuilders, um, got OSVs, which have been doing very well um, recently. We've got um, just just essentially going around the world and working out where where are assets that will be very hard to replace. That um, we're far from new build parity, and even when we achieve new build parity, there's no ability to build them. Um, I was talking about before and um and trying to just create a basket of them be diversified enough that um if if governments go after them um that can't hurt you too much and so that's kind of like the coal the coal thing no matter how attractive certain coal plays are i think probably be more and more diversified as time goes on and but yeah, just a, a real basket approach of all of these. If you were to hold a gun to my head, I'd probably say um, certain like drill ship players um, I probably have the biggest moat in the longest runway. Um, yeah, and that's that's kind of how I'm how I'm viewing things at the moment. Okay, so even though if you look at like the financials of the drill ships, they're not good now. You think that there's going to be a time where like the, like we talked about already, the capital moves in, and all of a sudden they just start cash flowing and do with the big dividend thing and all that. It's just right now, if you look at them, it's like they seem expensive, you know, still yeah. some of these offshore companies. Yeah, well, expensive versus what? That's the other thing. Like I've, I've had the conversation quite a bit lately that um, some people have been early to tidewater and it's like, oh, I'm getting uncomfortable with it. Um, it's really running and like, <clears throat> I want to I want to sell it. <laughs> it's the first question, like sell it for what? Like it's, um, I think we're very early and it's one of the hardest things to overcome is like a, a position that starts to get outsized if it's still far from what you deem like a like OSVs like they're still um, like Tidewater is still trading at a fraction of their new build um, value they um, there's a long runway but it, a lot of people will get very uncomfortable sort of holding that through till um new build parity and so if you sell it what do you put it into like I, I can accept if you're selling it to sort of fold it into a um into a coal company trading it two times cash flow like fine that that makes a lot of sense especially if um that said coal companies like attacking their own um share float like I, I love those plays kind of referring to them stealing um one each per bar 
I always butcher his name, his idea of cannibals, that you just want to find um, find these companies that are going to have have um, an ability to just pour free cash flow into um, buying back their own shares and do that over a long enough time frame and the, the returns can be pretty eye-popping. And yeah, that's also coming around to the idea of gold. I'm doing quite a bit of research on that at the moment as well as wow. I, I think I was kind of wrong on a few of my assumptions with gold and the fact that um, I didn't see the paper market getting taken out. Now I see, I think that's inevitable that the uh, paper market gets cleaned up over a long enough time frame, And so that'll, that'll be huge when that happens. Uh, so at the moment, it's just the, the Shanghai gold price is just constantly trading with a premium um, to the West, to London. And so the physical gold just keeps flowing into, into China and we're just handing them, handing them, paperback it's like the it's like the, i don't know if you've seen there's a cartoon and it's um it's got like the west and china and it's got um the west like throwing gold bricks over the fence and china throwing cash back at us and so on a long enough time frame i think they they're already using gold for settlement so i think yeah they'll they'll keep hoovering up the gold until the west sort of hits the wall financially and um and at that point it'll be be revalued pretty significantly so i kind of trying to work out how best to get some exposure to that as well okay wow that's fascinating okay but but you did bring up an absolutely brilliant important point which is that governments uh are going to come after these fossil fuel companies but like how can how really how really can they just cripple affordable energy like how far can they really go in the long term with that well to use um, australia as an example they can get a long way in saying that well take super profits off the companies and give it, um, put it into clean energy, renewable energy, just Australia even handed it straight out as cash <laughs> to people to help with the bills. It's, um, yeah, it's what I've, I've been wrong on a lot is like underestimating how dumb policy can be. And so now, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting though. I, it's, but the next 10 years, I guess, like it, that's where it gets hard because there'd have to be an energy crisis for them to stop hammering their fossil fuel assets, right? Yeah. Oh, well, it depends how it plays out because and how, how much runway the sort of the whole green movement has before people revolt against it. Uh, I'm always fascinated with Germany, how they've kind of destroyed their industrial, industrial base. It's, um, Kind of like there's a few people call them like canaries in the coal mine where you just watch because ultimately this is all kind of like a it's like a luxury it's like a luxury good in a way like democracy will correct will correct a lot of the stuff if you inflict too much pain on the voters yeah people 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 won't put up with um, crazy bills coming and you destroying their standard of living they won't they don't care enough about emissions to have their their bills go through the roof. Um, and I think a lot of ESG kind of flew under the radar. Well, a lot of it was like a, it was like a free a, a bonus. You got to feel good because a lot of ESG got bundled in with tech and it was like the perfect trade for um, right through to like 22 before it's when it kind of switched over um, was the fact that if you, if you owned anything kind of ESG based, the ESG trade was really like long tech because they came out with the highest um, ESG scores and dump everything energy based, and that that was that is kind of a long short trade was where you wanted to be for um, for a long time there, and so they were massively outperformed. Like, and um, everyone kind of loved the idea and thought that there was real real value in the idea, and it's only now that um, the wheels are really falling off, and I think that's just just really get started to gain momentum. I see like we've kind of seen with mag seven, mag six, mag five, mag four. Like yeah. And once 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 NVIDIA goes, I, th I think it's gonna be fascinating. Granted, these old these things always seem to continue longer than than I guess. Now you crushed that. You're, you're like the carbon trade, the hydrogen trade, all these assets like with with a high interest rate environment just 
crashed and a lot of them went like the high hydrogen companies are going bankrupt and stuff so like you just absolutely called the deflation of that bubble like you think that if governments are going to put money into it it's going to do well but no they just absolutely tanked all of them so it was, it was a time to have made money from them i know brad i didn't follow him into it but he he played some hydrogen hydrogen companies and made made a lot of money and um time his exit quite well yeah i'm a i'm a bit too much of a i just like my long-term trends i like to like really understand the thesis and then just hang on for dear life until i see it play out yeah but it's just so interesting because the the anti-government trade has done well like you think again you think there'd be a backstop because they're supporting it but but no they can't even prop up their agenda it seems it's crazy yeah it's it's fascinating even with evs i, I find evs endlessly fascinating because it was again like my my whole thesis was was almost wrong on EVs um, on a number of points because I kind of said that um, EVs wouldn't work because they couldn't achieve price parity with um, internal combustion engines. They couldn't. There were going to be too many constraints on the um, on materials like the likes of lithium, cobalt, nickel. Um, there was going to be um, and and the assumption that they would be required and there wasn't going to be sufficient range and there also wasn't the sort of ability to charge them with a the grid. And what actually happened was uh, BYD has, has achieved sort of price parity. So you can, you can buy a Seagull for 11,000 US, which is kind of fascinating. It's got a sodium iron battery or they're just building a factory for them now. They can achieve 300 Ks of range. So you've got your, you've got your price parity. You've got your, Pretty decent range, and um, the sodium ion obviously destroys a whole lot of the um, projections for requirements for lithium, cobalt, nickel. Um, but it also means that they're not limitations. So EVs could scale, um, as, as I say, they've got the range. But what remains is, I think, is still going to be that downfall is the um, the grids can't handle them, and um, and they simply can't be charged. And we're projecting a lot of what was almost like the, um, it's it's always a story of being very careful projecting something that is a luxury and a saturated market as like a trend. And I think that's what's happened. And even, even recently talking to Lewis Vincent Garv, he's saying that a lot of the demand that's been shown out of China, which it, it just looks like it's going crazy. There's massive uptake. All of that is just directives from state-owned entities. Actual retail um, uptake of EVs has been really poor. And it's um, it's because the charging infrastructure is quite limited. Anyone that had a space that could charge um, and had the char charging infrastructures already bought an EV. And from there, it becomes like, increasingly hard to get people to take up an EV. Like I've got, I've got an example of a friend I've got here. And we, we trained together a lot, um, BJJ, and he, um, he had an electric scooter for a while and the thing just drove him crazy. He got it because it had a set range, um, finds out the range doesn't actually exist because to make it, make it actually drivable, he has to put it in sport mode. So he lo loses half his range. If he puts his girlfriend on the back, he loses loses another half of his range. And so by the end of it, he can't actually can't actually drive anywhere um, further than like sort of the immediate um, immediate vicinity. And that sort of plays out for an awful lot of um, sort of the developing markets and, and developed markets to a certain extent. Like there's just, I, I had this chat with um, probably two years ago with Michael Kelly and he's, um, he's a professor at Cambridge and sort of a, an electrical um, engineer. And he's just saying, like, it's, it's really as simple as you have to dig up all the, the grid and lay down the fucking cable. You have to put in bigger transformers. And he said, like, you can, there's, there's absolutely no money going into it. The investments in um, grid infrastructure in the US, there's a great chart in the recent JP Morgan energy paper. It's just, it's, it's, it's like a chart going from the top left to the bottom right. Like they're just investing less and less in it every year. 
it's it's going nowhere near what it needs to be for um for ev uptake and going back to my friend with a scooter to, to fully charge that off like a standard wall socket it took him um at least all night if not um well into the morning so you're talking sort of he, he said for a full charge it was like 16 hours or something so Forget, forget to put the thing on charge. We'll need to jump on and take off again. And I, I assume the same uh, goes for EVs. It, so you need a parking spot, and then you need you need like higher sort of charging level. I, yeah, I just don't. I think the EV adoption rate is just going to really disappoint everyone. And so that that in itself is a massive opportunity, as I've been. Yeah, been on about for most of this interview that oh, it's not no. gonna not gonna damage or demand at all. I love that. I mean, I've, I've sat in a Tesla for like twenty five minutes waiting for it to charge. No one has time for that. But then, and then, like you're right with the range and stuff, the estimates. It's like your how how reliable is your the estimate on your laptop's battery life? Like it always says eight hours, but it's really like twenty or it's like two hours. That you know, yeah, and, yeah. yeah, they just diminish. And so, and then what you said is just so brilliant is that the the grid. It's like maybe the reason we're not investing in it is because we can't because like we're like our interest is now a trillion dollars and our debt is 35 trillion. It's like, could, could the UK after world war II just do a whole new big transformation given their financial situation? No. And we're going through all these different huge wars and stuff. So people are totally sleeping on the government's ability to make this stuff happen. And clearly though, they're not because they, they're not buying hydrogen They're not buying all this green stuff anymore. It seems. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because they're almost, they're almost pushing the wrong end of it as well. Like it's super inflationary when you consider like the Inflation Reduction Act is just pushing the the um, the the um, whether it's the renewable or the EV side of it without yeah. having the infrastructure in place. Like if it, yeah, I'd, I'd really recommend everyone like grab that um, that JP Morgan paper because that um, that they've been hammering that point for year after year. That the I, I think the, the number in my head was it was. 5.9% annual growth in transmission was required to keep up just with EV. And this is before you add in the AI requirements. And some some states have now tried to add AI because it's a it's a whole new sort of demand category if you're going to add a whole lot of um, data centers. And it's 5.9% growth per annum was required. And it's currently tracking at about 1.5%. <laughs> and that... that compounds over time and then you, as, as you pointed out as well like you're doing this with sort of a um terrible like debt position like the u.s has got a roll what eight trillion um and issue another another two trillion and this is the time that no one wants to buy it as well like the the um sort of being one of the more interesting thing is seeing just u.s just shoot itself in the foot again and again at a time where it should be out there on its knees, like asking people to buy their debt, like they've got to finance these, yeah. <laughs> finance all this, all this debt, and um, everyone's trying to get rid of it after they they grabbed they grabbed all the Russian reserves. So yeah, it's, yeah, um, it's, there's no chance that it working. Yeah, and then the data center thing, right? Like the growth and the energy needed to power AI is just unbelievable. And so I, I know they're, they're looking to nuclear for that. But again, that, that's that's interesting. I, I'm liking that because it's it's interesting when you consider the um, that's quite a like I always always found it interesting that got explained to me with like populism to an extent was the fact that with Republicans and Democrats it was always supposed to be like Democrats representing the people and Republicans representing business and then Democrats got kind of hijacked by big tech which was business business. And so there's no voice for the people. Yeah. And so it's they've got a lot of power. And if they can see the numbers don't work um, with the energy, then yeah, they'll really get behind nuclear. But that's that's just spitballing, I guess. I don't know. We'll, we'll see if it works. Yeah, that'll take again. That'll 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 take time to play out. Okay, so great. So you agree, diversified basket of offshore drilling companies and coal companies geographically dispersed should should weather the storm essentially yeah over over a long time like an important point with coal is a lot of people have been disappointed and i think it was going right back to where we started the conversation was just getting lucky with russia like it's um 
it's like when you buy cheap assets that'll be required like um in an energy crisis you've always got this like inherent free call option and so russia obviously was a massive boon for that like we've seen coal prices go through the roof and i think that's led some people to think coals especially thermal coal is more cyclical than it is when really the thesis was always this like winding out returns like um granted I, I didn't see thermal prices getting as punished as they are it's um it's like commodities they always seem to overshoot both ways um but it's almost it's got to get back to hated um and like destroy the last of the expectations of people so that it can get back to just quietly grinding out good returns like I've, it's always amazed me people like like i think we we're talking about fung ella um earlier and like you now people saying like oh i want to dump this and i was looking at it, it was like trading into negative ev for a while there like the market cap is lower than the cash balance it's like <laughs> that's yeah that's that's not what you dump yeah no. so it's bit, especially not when you look in the it's, it's just always got to be careful of um like immediate hindsight bias with kind of lost out on the last two winters in which they've been um they've been super warm and it's like are you are you gonna bet that that's that's a new trend that every winter is going to be warm you also had um record high wind speeds the last winter so you not only did you have the warm winter reducing heating you had high wind boosting um Electric generation, electric generation, and so next winter, maybe maybe it's cold and there's no wind. Like that, that's within possibility. And if I'm sitting on um, my coal stocks, I'm I'm basing it on just grinding it out with dividends. Then I have that free call option again, and that's what I love. Like, okay, if it doesn't happen, fine. I'll just yeah. keep keep um, grinding out the returns. If um, it does happen, then I've got that that optionality, but. Not, not too much can go wrong if you're buying something that's um, got more cash than market cap. <laughs> exactly. But that's why, like, when I look at coal versus offshore, I'm like, the coal looks more just from a ca from a fundamental cash flow perspective currently just more, like, attractive because of the dividends. Yeah, the offshore has has it going for it that it's harder to steal from. I, I always had an idea, uh, sort of a theory of picks and shovels. So yeah. most offshore players are quite geographically diversified they're a service company so they're like the middleman so the, the easiest assets to steal are always fixed assets like a coal mine or something it's it's they can't pack up their coal mine and move right to, move it to the caymans or something <laughs> yeah. and so yeah they'll, they'll always get punished so that's why i was kind of pushing more more diversification with that than the um yeah the, the offshore services are kind of a sweet spot there which um, they're harder to steal from. Gotcha. And then, yeah, we'd love to hear more about your gold thesis as it plays out because it's a different supply demand dynamic, it seems. Yeah. 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 I'm not, I always stayed away from gold. Like I've never even owned a single gold producer goes for silver as well. Um, until, until really recently. And it was just, I didn't, I didn't see the, um, the setup being nearly as juicy as such. And, kind of changed my mind now with um yeah as i said what i was talking about earlier with um with china just slowly because if they are going to use it as settlement it's a, it's a tiny market oil, oil's massive if they start um if they start really um using it in that function then yeah gold price could go could go crazy and it's also not a bad place to be either and uh, I'm, I'm just kind of protecting myself like the worst thing you do is think you'd be too too smart and know exactly what will play out. So if something looks like it's got a lot of asymmetry, then I'll, I'll have a position there as well. It's There's a certain amount of that within the portfolio as I like to split up um, asset classes because it's um, it's always sort of hindsight knowing what actually happened. Like I never would have picked coal would have outperformed uranium uh, that period of the Russian invasion. And then... Um, wouldn't have picked that all the financial vehicles were the ones to jump on uranium. I thought I thought it would have been more the the um, utilities were what would have got the party started. And so, yeah, it's always going to be careful, careful thinking things were more obvious than they were. It's obviously hindsight bias. 
Hmm. Yeah, but I'm, I'm looking at the charts of these gold stocks and they're just like really low. So it's interesting. That, that's the other beautiful thing is I've, I've got one or two that I've got my eye on at the moment. They're just getting smashed. And I'm like, um, like I, I love it when I open up some of the, some of the stories at the moment. Like it's just the, um, yeah, it's just pure negativity, which attracts, attracts me as well. When I'm seeing some parts of the portfolio, like I've, I've got a few of the names. I, I was just looking at before I've got the toolbar on Apple and I pulled the toolbar across and like a few of my uranium positions are five, six percent and this other um, gold position or two is like minus five percent. I'm like, that's that's what I want to see. Yeah. yeah. That div divergence. Yeah. That's that's a beautiful time to be building a position when it's kind of hitting damn near all time lows. Yeah. Exactly. So we'll be looking forward to hear what you think about that going moving forward. And then, um, but out of respect for that, you're the people that subscribed to you on Substack, I haven't mentioned specific names. So where can people go to kind of dig deeper and understand what you're doing personally and just stay on top of updates from you? Thanks. Yeah, it's pretty much everything I do now. It's just on the Substack. So that's um, Cody Ferg at Substack.com. Um, yeah, pretty much I write a piece a week or um, we'll interview someone smart and send out a weekly what I call Ferg's Finds, which is just the most interesting piece I've read, the most interesting podcast to come across, quotes, um, tweets, and something I'm, I'm pondering in a, in a chart. And that's just free, and I send that out every week. So, yeah, if you're interested, just um, subscribe there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Super, super, super helpful. Great. No, it's always a pleasure coming on. Please.